He is a good master. Amongst all the other things, that's all you ever know, that fear. He's got a good master. That's why a slave wouldn't want to go. So instead of going free, I don't want to go out and use this freedom and get in trouble again and get in, indebted to another master who might not be as good as you. I want to stick with you because you're so good to me. You're so wise and you give me, you give me food and you give me wisdom and you just look after me. So what that slave would then become is a bond servant. He would willingly subject himself to that master. Willingly. Because he's a good master. And that's what Paul is doing here. He says that I'm a slave, I'm a bond servant to Christ Jesus. He is my master. This is who, this is my identity now. He also says he's called to be an apostle. This word apostle, it's actually come, it comes from the Greek secular word that has to do with cargo ships. And it's apostolic ships. And these these boats, these big cargo vessels, they would, actually, they would actually be commissioned by some institution to go out on a specific mission to you know, wherever they want to go uh, with um, cargo on it, with, with this, with this uh, cargo. And you wouldn't, even, you wouldn't use these boats to go fishing or go on a cruise or anything. You, these ships are specifically designated for a mission to go out with this cargo. Now, doesn't that sound familiar? Doesn't that sound like something we should be doing? That's what the word apostle comes from. Is that you are sent forth, that you are sent forth with this precious cargo. And Paul says that his cargo is the gospel of God. He was set aside. God sent him aside, bound him off, and said, Look, you're existing because I want you to preach the gospel. This is why you exist, is to preach this gospel, to be a cargo ship for, for my word. And so we go into how he describes where the gospel came from. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures regarding the Son. The gospel he promised beforehand. I don't know if you guys know this, but the Bible is split up into two different sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now the New Testament was written about 700 years, depending on what book you want to use that. This is about 700 years after the Old Testament. So back in Jesus' day, the only thing that was around their Bible was the Old Testament. And what this Old Testament taught is the same thing as ours. It taught that there was a coming Messiah that would come and free the slaves, and free, um, free everyone from tyranny, free people from, from uh, mis mistreatment or, or enslavement. People looked to the Old Testament for the hope that a Messiah would come. And I was reading up on this, and it turns out there are 365 prophecies that the Old Testament gives us in regards to this Messiah. And it blew my mind. I was, I was floored by some of these prophecies, how accurate they were. I picked out three. You guys want to see them? You guys want to see them? You guys want to see the promises that God fulfilled in the Old Testament? We just went through um, Christmas. And Isaiah was talking to the house of David. And they were asking for a sign. And, they said, and Isaiah said, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. And will call him Emmanuel. <coughs> This was written 700 years before he, before he was born. If I, were to ask you, if I were to ask you to write down something that your great, 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 great grandson, that's actually like less than. 700 years, something that your great grandson would do, the most important, the details of his birth, the most important aspects of his life, if I asked you to do that, could you do that? No. That's crazy, and I don't want you guys to miss the gravity of 700 years. Because what that says, what that says is that God is from eternal to eternal, He's always there. Everlasting to everlasting, from the beginning to the end. He called you apart, He set Paul aside for this gospel that He promised beforehand. Christianity is not a new religion. It's not a new belief. It is the fulfillment of old promises. It's the fulfillment of God's promises to Abraham, to David. That's what, that's what we believe. Here's the second one. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Isaiah wrote the 700 years about a servant, this, 
serve God, come down from God, and be subject to this. This is obviously. Then they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, and they mocked him, saying, prophesy to us, Christ, who hit you? How accurate is that? That's nuts. That's crazy. Here's one that for me. This, is, this, is, this one kind of shocked me because I didn't know about this one. Um, and it's uh, the retelling of when Jesus died and he was going to get buried. As evening approached, there came a rich man from, how do you pronounce it? Arimathea. Uh, everyone knows except me. <laughs> Arimathea, named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it would be given to him. Joseph took that body, wrapped it in clean linen cloth, and placed it in his new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. So this rich guy named Joseph comes and he has this new tomb carved out. And he has this brand new tomb and he wants to use it for Jesus because he's a disciple of him. So he goes and asks for Jesus' body and he places it into his tomb. This rich guy just, you know, he's just a regular disciple of Jesus. Want to see what Isaiah wrote? He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. He, Jesus was crucified with two criminals, and he had a rich man's tomb. Isaiah, Isaiah wrote down, and God prophesied for him that, that this would come to pass, that rich people would be you know, involved in the circumstances of his death, that wicked people would be involved in the circumstances of his death. I was like, whoa. That's, that's only a God thing. And then he goes on to describe the gospel. Actually, he goes on to describe who Jesus is. And he says in verse 3, Who as to his human nature was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the Son of God, by his resurrection from the dead, and Jesus Christ our Lord. So he says that God, or Jesus, was fully human. He came from the line of David, which was promised to them. God promised David, back in the Old Testament, way back when, that, you know, on the side would come from your line's rule from all, for all nations, forever. And so Jesus was the fulfillment of that promise. But more than that, he was, a, he was fully human. Um, I was sick the Monday before Christmas, and I was deathly sick. And I caught this, like, the end of this, like, flu sick wave that was going around. And people before me, people were getting sick, and I, was, I always thought they were, like, you know, Nancy Pants, you know, <laughs> silly Sally, you know, they come on, just, oh. just, uh, oh, no. All right. What's I saying? Nancy Pants, Silly Sally. Nancy Pants and Silly Sally. This is what I thought of people when they got sick. Because I, I, I actually just got finished telling Pastor Scott, I never get sick. I like, I have my, my endorphins or whatever, I don't know, it just fights off sickness, and I, I'm going to go, I never get sick. But, <laughs> I don't know, don't know. <laughs> but, my immune system, there you go. <laughs> but, See, I, I thought these guys who were sick before me, I never really understood it until I got sick. Then now, after, like, I had the chills, I had body aches, I was dizzy, I couldn't even stand up. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't even stand up. But I could now relate to those people who were sick, and I could have more, you know, sympathy with them. I could, I could relate to them better. And that's what Jesus came down here to do. He became human so he could relate to us. He, he became human. He didn't have to become human. He was up in heaven, and maybe the angels were just like, you don't have to come. <laughs> you, don't have to go, you don't have to go down to earth and, you know, do all this and subject yourself to all the sorrow, everything that's broken about this world. You don't have to do it, but he did. He did. And he says here, he's also the son of God, and there was never a more clear picture of that when he rose from the dead. Only God could do that. And so I want to put up a a phrase on the screen. But before I do that, it's, I think it's the most important part of 
the service, or at least my sermon. And I, I'd like to pray, if it's okay with you guys. And I want you guys to pray for something specific. I want you guys to pray for that, that you would get it. That you would get how much God loves you. That you would get the gravity of that. So let's, let's pray. Lord, this is You love us so much, Lord, and sometimes we forget about that. I pray that you Holy Spirit work in our lives, work in our hearts right now, so that we would get how much you love us. That we would take seriously your word and what it says for us. It's an easy name.